My name is Angel Francisco Martinez. Today we're going to do a webinar over 3D excavations by Tunnel Boring Machine. I'm going to do a, a brief introduction and then I will go into the advantages of modeling tunnels in the program GTSNX by the finite element method. And then we'll go into what is the direct demo demonstration of how to model the a tunnel boring machine excavation using software. So first with the intro, just briefly, who, who we are. We are Midas. We are the number one developer of civil engineering software in the world. Our headquarters is in Seoul, South Korea. And as you can see on the map, we have uh, those, those bigger dots are the branch offices we have around the world. We're currently transmitting live from our New York City office. Jumping into the topic of today of why modeling tunnels in finite element 3D is important. So numerical analysis, analysis or numerical modeling has allowed us to analy analyze these complex tunnels especially in different methods of excavation, as long as they're in sequence. And this is due to the fact that they allow us to represent properly the nonlinear behavior of the materials through the constitutive models. We can also very accurately now represent the geometries of the structures, as well as apply realistic boundary conditions and loads. All that together with other advanced couplings, like being able to check the soil structure interaction, as well as the other critical processes like settlement or seepage. So on top of that, everything or all the displacements of the ground associated with excavations are actually, of course, happening in three, three directions. And so to accurately represent this behavior during excavations, we must model in 3D. And so 3D modeling is actually uh, becoming more and more attractive. It's uh, partly because there's known limitations for modeling in 2D, especially for tunnels that have curves or intersections. And also, you know, the results are just more accurate. So we'll jump into uh, how Midas GTSNX, which is one of these uh, softwares for microanalysis, can fully integrate all the considerations one needs to have for analyzing tunnels. So starting with the interface, uh, GTSNX has a very intuitive user interface, makes it very easy to navigate. Everything is grouped by tabs, and all the commands are icon-based, almost as you are used to if you ever worked with AutoCAD. There's the you know the work tree that organizes everything, and there's also a message window that guides you, gives you warnings, and lets you know the progress of the analysis. Other neat features of the program is the commands it has for drawing from scratch. So it, they are almost the same as you would see in, in CAT software. So you can have special drawing windows, for instance, for drawing tunnel sections by different kind of cuts. You can draw it directly in a work grid and then very easily then extrude it to make a, a 3D tunnel out of it. Or if you needed to give it a curve, you can also do other commands like sweep or revolve. So these are commands that everybody is familiar with in, you know, in AutoCAD softwares, and it's it's the same kind of integration that, that we've included in the interface for GTSNX. But apart from that, once you start to getting, especially in 3D, either creating complex geometries or importing 3D complex geometries from AutoCAD, we have additional tools to verify that the program recognizes contact between these different layers. Correct it if necessary in, in a single command. In this case, it's called auto connect. And then last, lastly, after meshing, we also have specific commands that allow you to verify the mesh connection. So you don't have to get to the end of the analysis to figure out that something was not properly connected. This is one of the arguably one of the most tedious or difficult processes of modeling uh, excavations or tunnels in 3D is just making sure that everything is properly connecting in term, at the level of the mesh. The program has some nice features for controlling the size of your mesh. So you don't have to do blocks of different sizes of meshes by strata. You can actually select faces of geometries and assign, let's say, a fine mesh, and then have a, a coarser mesh boundary control so that you have that linear 
and uniform or linear grading over the model. And the other aspect is that the program is great for the kind of projects in 3D that require the support elements to be either completely embedded or connected to the solid, or as you know, just any any kind of combination of support element, be it like a beam or a pile with a 2D wall element, or a shot creek or lining of the tunnel and the 3D soil. In terms of what the software can do, it can do, it's a complete software for modeling 3D projects and any kind of geotech projects. So for tunnels, we can actually capture any, any kind of tunnel, any kind of excavation method, be it with a reinforced umbrella or by TVM as we'll see today, any kind of intersections or multiple layers or uneven terrain that we have to consider including fault lines. If we're talking about special kind of circumstances, uh, if you need to consider the water pressure for your during your excavation, and in you know in the case of the water pressure just being constant, uh, it's very easy to apply the water table or water level by selecting a a face of the geometry or defining a height based on the reference of the origin, and then the program you can tell it to automatically consider this water pressure on, as a load to your structural support elements. So this can be done very easily. However, if you have a more advanced case in which there's going to be a change in water level over time, or you need to consider some sort of drain condition or some sort of uh, tunnel being, I guess, improved by making it impermeable, then you can also consider what would be a semi or fully coupled stress seepage analysis. Those are different kind of special boundary conditions, and that actually allows the program to estimate flow paths, flow quantity, and if you needed to, as we said, uh, seepage cutoff elements to represent what would be impermeable uh, layers on the support structure. The software does have a complete database of structural support elements, and you can even find the sections by international codes. And so you can capture any kind of support structure you want to with the program, uh, tunnel walls, rock balls, shot creek, uh, anchors, pre-stressed, or uh, soil nails, any, anything you want to model as far as support structures. The program has some other benefit or neat features for modeling these kind of sequential excavations. And in our case, as we will see and once we get into the tutorial, uh, one of the commands we'll be using that's key for this is called the change, change property for construction stages. So what is, this allows us to do is it allows us to use the same element with different material properties during the construction process. So for example, in our tunnel boring excavation process, first these uh, rings will be part of the excavation as the machine is passing by. But then later, uh, in uh, later stages, the rings towards the end will start to be, be reactivated, now considered with segments or what would be reinforced concrete material properties in sequence. Hence, the, the same one mesh set will have multiple functions in the process. And similarly for what would be, in this case, these 2D shell elements, Originally, they would be shield of the tunnel boring machine. It'll have a steel property. And then as once the machine pass, the tunnel boring machine finishes the excavation and passes completely through, these elements will then be reactivated with a different material now, grout. It'll basically represent the grouting that's being injected between the concrete segments and the spacing, the remaining spacing of the tunnel that was just excavated. So these elements will have or can have multiple uh, behaviors or multiple materials in a single model through the construction stage uh, boundary condition. Here's a, a list of the main considered models that we have available for, for these kind of analyses. So if you're particularly modeling in rocks, your tunnels in rocks, the, the more popular would be the Hope Brown or the joint rock mass. For the Hulk Brown, it's basically a very easy input. You go into our, this is a screenshot of, our, of the window, input window in, in Midas. And so you would give parameters like the intact rock parameter, the geological strength index, and the service factor. And the program will automatically convert it into what would, or the original Hulk Brown input parameters. 
And so this makes it uh, very practical to run. Here's the, I guess, the failure contrarian for, for Hawk Brown. And here, here is the screenshot of the window, input window for the joint rock mass. So when you have rock layers that are going to have different properties, and in this case, we're saying the normal direction, but it can be in different directions, then you can use this, this kind of material to capture up to three joints. And so you see here, you can input your main, I guess your, your main directional layer, um, elastic modulus and shear modulus, and then your perpendicular or normal direction, elastic modulus and shear modulus, as well as we mentioned up to three joints. So these are some interesting constitutive models that allow you to more accurately capture the behavior of tunnels being excavated, especially in rocks. So one of the nice benefits of the program when, when you have these kind of analysis is that we can set up what's called a parametric analysis. So I can do or set up one single model and then specify to the program just by creating additional material properties specified to the program that once I have finished running this analysis with you know in all the sequence of the stages, that I would additionally like to inspect what it would be like if, let's say, for my ground mesh it, instead of using more column, I use my hook brown material. And the program will automatically generate everything the same, all the case analysis case and stages and everything in the same sequence, and simply replace the material that I specified. So that I can now run in one single model, just click it, uh, click to run the analysis once, but actually compare what would be two different, two entirely different cases for the material behavior. So this can become really handy also for getting ranges of values. You can vary any parameter you want within the material that you're defining, and so you can, in essence, have like an upper boundary and a lower boundary of the behavior you're trying to capture in, in your model in a very easy way. The program can also consider what would be major fault lines uh, using interfaces or allowing you to directly just in the geometry divide the two models and apply what would be a, uh, a smaller, thinner shell element with a, a different material property. So you, you can capture almost any kind of behavior you're, you're trying to do in 2D or 3D in terms of faults using interfaces. And some other key parameters uh, or key considerations is you can also have the or simulate the contraction of what would be the support elements, either the shield or the support beams on a, on a tunnel, especially for TBM. This is something that's uh, important to, to consider. And if you're doing that, uh, one of the things that's also very important to the engineer is to be able to determine the material status during the construction process. So the program allows you to identify the failure by different types. Uh, so you can activate directly, it'll show you what's being, uh, what's gone under plastic failure, what's still under the loading and unloading regions, either in 2D or 3D. And for the same model, you can also actually compare that with the other kind of special result, which would be the safety result by the more column criteria. So you can activate uh, ranges of factors of safeties by volumes of, of soil or basically of elements. And so in this case, uh, anything close to or under 1.2 factor of safety will be already considered to have failed or to be in the plastic failure region. So we see that comparison here by activating uh, with this range of values, either in the 2D, we see a similar behavior than when we're checking the material status. And in this case, for, for a 3D model, we can also see this is the volume of soil activated with a factor of safety of 1.2 or lower, which in this stage matches uh, similarly what we're seeing for the status here. So these are also some neat features for, especially for excavating uh, or, or excavating tunnels. And some other advanced considerations, if you have a really deep tunnel and, and you don't want to necessarily model all the, all the layers of, of soil down to or up to the surface and where your tunnel is going to be, you can actually state uh, initial stress or force conditions, like force conditions directly on the element, through the elements and it can be in different directions or over planes. So these are some other features that are make it more realistic to run your analysis in 3D. Depending on the tunnel and who you're presenting to, or actually even if you wanted to just uh, inspect the, 
the results of the tunnel by giving it a simu a walkthrough, if, if you will, or in this case, we call it the flight simulator. The program does allow you to establish a path and almost give it like a virtual tour of what it is the tunnel is going to end up looking like. Uh, in the in the model, you can actually pause the simulation and activate any result you want and then rotate the view. So you can almost like inspect the tunnel as if you were walk giving it a final walkthrough in, real, in the real project. And then other features, uh, you know, if, you, if you're in an urban area or there's some sort of critical building or adjacent structure that you would like to consider in your project, for instance, here, we have this building that was imported from our structural package Midas Gen. The foundation and everything was meshed together. And in this case, now there's going to be a new tunnel being excavated. And one can determine you know, things to a higher degree of accuracy as to how that might affect the settlement or you know, if the foundation is strong enough or what kind of, if, you know, basically what kind of effect a potential new tunnel excavation could have on existing structures, but now with a you know, more realistic behavior in place. Some other unique things the program has are the Tunnel Wizard. We'll have a training about this next month, specifically on how to go through this, but it's basically four tabs that allow you to make a, a whole model in 3D. It's this, uh, defining the method cut, the, the stages of excavation, and the mesh in a single window. This saves a lot of time. Similarly, for support elements like anchors, you can easily create for 2D or 3D, specify a, a direction, how much is grouted and ungrouted, and if it needs to be pre-stressed. Most importantly for tunnels, though, is our construction stage wizard. This allows us to set up uh, what are you know, typical tunnel projects in a very easy manner. Some of the, sometimes these can take up to hundreds of excavation stages. With this feature, we can, instead of manually having to set up each stage, we can do it by applying rules. The way this works then is, here's a very simplified example. We have what basically are called remove and activate commands for sets. So I would specify all my mesh meshes for tunnel in a given uh, order. So I would assign a numerical sequence to them, starting with one and ending in, let's say, 10 or 20. Similarly for my support elements. And then I would be able to tell the program, so start removing our tunnels starting at stage one and incrementing uh, every, every state or every two stages. And then similarly, I can tell it also activate my support elements, the shock creek and the rock bolts, and starting in stage two and go every two stages. And when I apply these rules, we see here a very simplified window of this. We see now here that my tunnels are being removed in stage one and then in stage three, stage five. So skipping every two as I specified, and my support elements are being activated in stage two and then every, every two as well, two, four. So these repetitive sequences are now here reflected directly in what would be the construction stage window. We see here that stage one now is removing the first excavation of the tunnel, and stage two is now activating the support elements. So instead of me having to do this over and over manually for the remaining sets of excavations, this simple rule allows the program to just do that for you automatically. So this saves a lot of time for all the advanced stage or you know the projects that have a lot of repetitive stages. Once you're finished, you can actually also inspect what would be your stage construction. So here we're looking at the construction of today's session. We see first the rock, then the shield, then the support, the joint segments, the rings, which are represented in the blue, and then the black to the sh is the grouting. So the shield excavates, installs the support segments, and then grouting is injected. And this is the sequence of the excavation of what we're modeling today. This is just from the post-processor looking at the results also in the excavation sequence. So you start to get an idea of the program's very powerful post-processor or graphic uh, graphics that you can record any kind of video for your presentations or for results. And other features that are of interest is you can actually, within the construction stage, also generate a data table and export, export directly to Excel on what's happening in every stage in terms of the volume of material being either excavated or installed. So we can see here how much has been excavated in stage one and stage two by volume of, I guess in this case, material, rock or soil or whatever. Getting now into the demo, I'm actually gonna go through the steps of this tutorial. 
and this is what we're going to be simulating. These are the dimensions of the project. Basically, we're going to have a sequence of the interior ring and exterior ring being excavated. When we're going to also simulate what would be the pressure on the face of the tunnel boring machine as a load. And then we're going to be subsequently also considering the advancement of the excavation first with uh, 2D elements as shields, as we see here represented in this, uh, this image in white. And then, this, as we mentioned, these elements will be reactivated as these concrete segments in, in the sequential order. Other loads that will be considered will be also the jack forces that will be applied to simulate the basically advancement of the tunnel bore machine are these pistons or these jacks pushing off the nearly installed rings, as well as, of course, the contraction forces that are uh, first acting on the shield and, lay, and then later acting on the grouting and the you know, uh, support segments. So this is, in a nutshell, the process of what we're going to be modeling. And you can kind of see here from this different sets of colors, more or less, the, the number of sequences of the progress of the tunnel as it's excavated and reinforced. So again, briefly, now by color coding it as far as the properties of the set of the elements, let's assume everything is you know just intact, in this case, rock. We see here now, if we remove and only activate the tunnel elements, as the tunnel is being excavated, we're also activating this 2D shield, as we see here in white, which represents the steel shield of the tunnel boring machine. So we have excavation, and then later, we're going to have stages for activating the support. So we see here now, uh, even as the shield advances, we start to see the appearance of these blue segments. So these are now the shock creek, or the, sorry, the reinforced concrete tunnel rings or tunnel segments. And then as this is advancing even further, eventually uh, in subsequent stages, we're also going to reactivate the, this shield is uh, not activated, not left on entirely. We see that it's advancing. It has a certain length. And then the segments are also deactivated, only to be later uh, applied now with the new material, which is the grouting. And so it ends up happening. Uh, you continue to go through the excavation. The shield keeps advancing, also simulating the activation of the support, uh, the segments, the ring segments, as well as the grouting until we reach the end. And we have the full tunnel excavated and all the reinforced materials or the segments, the ring segments and the grouting activated. So these are the two materials that we're using for the 3D elements, which would be, uh, we're modeling the soil as more column. And then once the soil is, the exterior rings that were excavated originally as soil are reactivated, they'll have the segment material properties, which is in this case is just concrete and we're simulating using elastic constitutive model. And then similarly for the 2D elements, we'll initially originally use the shield as steel. And then later, once it finishes passing through us, the excavation is complete and the reinforcement is activated, the grouting, the element will be reactivated as grouting material grout to simulate the injection of the grout between the segments and the excavated tunnel. So I'll jump now into the press the training. So here we're opening the program. Uh, we will share with you what would be the start file for this tutorial, which will already have the materials defined. But it's uh, a very easy way to define the materials. If you're not familiar, it's uh, something that takes a very little time. In this case, there's only four for materials to be fine. So here, I'm just going to go ahead and start drawing. Uh, on my work plane, as we saw, I just drew a rectangle by inputting coordinates. I said the bottom left corner was 0, 0, and the top right was 50, 50. Now I'm defining the circles of the tunnel. I'm giving it the location to be 25, 25, the center of this square. And now I'm defining what is the radius of the circle. So we see that it lines up in the center because I knew the dimensions. And I'm going to apply a outer circle to represent the outer ring. So I give it the same location as far as the center of the circle being at 25, 25, but now I give it a larger radius. 
And now starting from this 2D face or these 2D drawings, I'm going to extrude them to make the 3D solids. Just like you would in AutoCAD, I now change my view to isometric. And I select the axis and the direction of which I want to extrude. In this case, it's going to be extruded in the Y axis. And I give it the distance, which is 20 meters. And I can preview this to make sure it's as far as I want to go. So once I click OK, we see now that I have my surfaces. But more importantly, I also now have my solids. So I can easily tell the program that you know basically these are connected. Uh, these are going to be elements that are almost like embedded in, inside. We see now that it's not just one block and a cylinder coexisting, but it's actually a cylinder inside of the, of the block. The program is now recognizing that it's essentially going to turn into a tunnel. What I'm doing now is in the works tree, I am specifying by pressing F2 on my keyboard, I can change the name. I'm just specifying what each geomet geometry is for to keep track, uh, especially when it comes to the later stages that we're going to be meshing. Uh, we can change the view, make a different perspective. Uh, you know, here and I'm actually just going to make it a little easier to see what's happening inside. So I made it to only show the linear boundaries or the make it transparent. I go back to drawing and I'm going to draw a rectangle that just needs to be big enough to cover the, the tunnel because I'm going to use this rectangle. I'm going to make copies of it and use it to divide up my tunnel into the segments that will you know, end up being excavated. So here I'm just going to tell it copy and I want to tell it the distance to be one meter 19 times. So I'm specifying now basically there's going to be 20 excavation stages. So I will get rid of the first segment that I have here. I changed my filter to easily uh, select what would be a 2D geometry, which we call a face, uh, instead of the others, which are like solids or stuff. So I'll get rid of this first face, since it's not, it's not going to be uh, useful for dividing my tunnel. And now I can actually proceed to divide. So I will go to Solid Divide. My targets, of course, are going to be the tunnel geometries, the inner and exterior tunnels or circles. The surfaces will be the ones that I'm using as tools to divide. And then additionally, I'm telling it to divide any of the touching faces of the solid, basically so that the tunnel divisions line up with the ground. And we see here now, once I've divided, we have the distributions of these tunnels sections now. And in the work tree, because I named that ahead of the division, uh, the program is at least grouping them for me automatically. And so this also makes it a lot easier. You know, once I in the when I only had one, you know, one geometry for the inner and one for the external to name it, it's much faster than going back and doing it now. So uh, here I'm changing my s filter not only uh, to the whole, so I can select the whole sets. And we see here the, the rings. Uh, so they have the right name, but they don't necessarily have the right uh, number associated to them in terms of a sequence. As we were saying for excavation logic, that, that's really important. So you can, take a, you, you can take a little time to order them, and then the program will, you can then tell them to sort them in, in order of the name. So we see here now, as so I'm going through my, my list, it's uh, in increasing from you know, 1 to 20 in the direction of excavation, which is going to be from left to right along the y-axis. So by doing this, by keeping your work street organized, we'll, we'll get the benefit of being able to use the stage wizard and set up simple rules, repetitive rules for the excavation process and the reinforcement process. So here we're defining size control. As, as we saw, that this allows us to have more, as the name states, control on how the mesh will line up. So now I'm going to first mesh my 
inner circle, the inner part of the tunnel. I give it a size. I select that type of uh, element shape. And from the work tree, if I hold down to shift, I can select all the, or multiple geometries. So in this case, I selected all, all 20 and I'm meshing in parallel. And I will repeat the process to mesh the external circle or the uh, outer part of the tunnel. And notice that originally I'm selecting these geometries and I'm assigning the soil material. So as we said first, they, they have the original soil material. And then you know, as after they're excavated, they will be reactivated with a different material and property. And of course now I also have to mesh the remaining terrain or the rest of the, the ground model. And for this, I can give it a, a larger size to cut down on computation time, let's say four meters. So every four meters, there's gonna be a node if you were thinking about like the spacing in a, in a straight line. And we see the preview, you kind of get an idea of the dimensions. So one, uh, I guess, comment for, for meshing in 3D, especially meshing tunnels, is always start with your, in terms of sta uh, steps for, for meshing, always start with the tunnel part, with the smaller, the elements or, or sections that are gonna have smaller geometry, smaller mesh sizes, so that you see here the program will kinda, you can see the discretion or, or the growth of the element sizes toward the outer boundary. So that's what you wanna have. This ensures more accurate results in the part of the project that matters, which is the tunnel. But you can also have the larger elements towards the outer boundary that will reduce in the computation time. So always start meshing first the tunnel. What I'm gonna do next is now use a command that's called extract. And from here, basically, I can now generate my 2D shell support elements from the faces of my existing 3D mesh. So in order for me to be able to use this extract command, uh, I first had to mesh the solids of the outer ring of the tunnel. And now I can either select the faces of the elements or to save time, I can also just select the faces of the geometry of the, you know, of this external tunnel. And when I apply extract, uh, there will be a 2D element associated to all the faces of this 3D geometry. And it will have, in this case, we're gonna assign the steel property, as, as we're saying, this is gonna be representing the shield of the tunnel boring machine. Other things here, I'm activating a skip duplicate faces. So the faces in between the rings, uh, I, I'm telling it that I don't necessarily, I don't need elements extracted there. And to register the base on ownership, basically I'm telling it that I want this to be individual segments, not just one solid shell, so that I can activate them in sequence. So we see here now that if I scroll to the, in the work street to the mesh sheds, I now have my, what I am calling shield with the steel property. These are 2D elements. However, because I use the geometry of a, of a 3D solid, I need to get rid of the extra faces that were generated. For example, in the, I guess, beginning and end of the tunnel, the outer faces, those are generated, those actually don't represent or will be used for anything in, you know, in the real model. So I can delete that by selecting the ends on the side view. And if I go to the front view, we can see that this, uh, you know, these solid rings have an outer, but are also an inner face. So the program generated these 2D shells on both faces. And so I have to carefully draw a selection poly circle in order to capture all the inside shells and delete those as well. I only want to retain the outer shell of the tunnel, which is basically the correct way to interpret the shield. So 
So now when I, I'm finished deleting all the excessive, we see the retaining 2D shells on the outer ring of the tunnel. So now I'm going to use this command called rename just to make sure that all my sets are in the right sequence in terms of the direction I'm going to be excavating. So I'm first selecting, selecting the outer, outer rings or the external circles. And the program allows us to uh, specify a very easy rule. I can actually tell it by coordinate system. So I'm telling it it's going to be excavated, let's say, in the y direction. So I want you to ascending order or incre incrementing order and just give it the name external circle hashtag blank starting with number one. So now the program knows starting in this case in the Y direction from left to right to order them with external number one and then two and then three in increasing order or ascending order as we, as we call it here. And we repeat the same for the inner circle. We say it's along the Y axis to start with number one and to be in ascending order, and I just give it a name with a, a hashtag at the end to specify that this is where the numbering begins. And then lastly, we do that for the shield. And so this is organizing my work tree to, again, work with the rules that we will be specifying under the construction stage wizard. And so here we go to shield, and then we put the specification starting with number one and then ending in number 20 from left to right along the y-axis. So we are done with the meshing aspect, and we can move on to start applying boundary conditions and loads. So self-weight would be, of course, the or gravity would be the, the first load we always consider. And that's easily applied, just specifying the direction of gravity to be down. And then we will proceed to specify what would be now the loads of the tunnel excavation process or, or the tunnel boring machine. So we can apply these two elements, but we can also sometimes much easier apply to faces of geometry. And GTS will automatically transfer that information to the corresponding elements of that geometry set. So for instance here, we're going to first apply the pressure load of the tunnel boring machine on the, you know, as the tunnel is being excavated. So we're going to select the faces and, and we specify it in the, in the tutorial. But here we basically started in the third ring, inner ring, and we're specifying the direction to be either normal or in this case by a, a reference coordinate system, we're saying in the y direction, and we're specifying the pressure load to be 200 kilonewtons per meter squared. And so we're going to call this the hydraulic press load, or basically as the machine is pressing on the tunnel during the excavation. And so we apply it on the, on the first geometry, and then we repeat the process for the subsequent geometries. As we see here, we're simulating that the machine advances two rings in every excavation process. So the next load will be uh, HP2 and so on. We would repeat the process for the remaining inner circle phases. So as it's clear it's much easier to apply these kind of loads by selecting a single geometry phase than trying to capture the, the faces of the elements. So the program is neat in that respect that it will transfer that information. So here we get to the last one, which would be the hydraulic pressure nine. And we see here the it's very clear now the direction of excavation from left to right are along the y-axis. We're now going to proceed to apply the jack thrust load. Basically what the simulate as the tunnel boring machine is pushing off to, to go forward. 
in this case is we're activating the uh, even number on the outer rings. So the way the tunnel boring machine works is as it's excavating, uh, once it goes through excavation stages, it adds in the reinforcement stages, it adds these concrete rings behind it. And then the jacks thrust off these concrete rings or push off these concrete rings. So this is why we're applying this jack thrust load on the outer rings, on the faces of the outer rings. But we see now that we're in the opposite direction of the of what the other load was applied. So we see here now it's applying it to the left, basically simulating in which direction the machine is pushing off. So of course this is in the opposite direction of the pressure load that we applied. So here again, it's repetitive and I, I just kind of skipped ahead if I was like applying it to all the other rings so we get to the end of it so this is the load j for jack jack thrust as we called it and then the remaining loads will be the pressure loads that are going to be concentric on the shield and on the segments the steel segments sorry the concrete segments that are reinforcing the tunnel So again, I only activate the outer rings. I'm actually going to change this by right clicking. I can change the display mode of this. So it was only showing the lines. Now it's showing also shading. And so I go back to pressure load. And you see there I'm changing the selection and to face in terms of how I'm applying this load. So again, uh, in this tutorial, we're simulating the advancement of, of the segments two at a time. And this is obviously entirely up to the to the engineer to decide what how much is advancing in, in the simulation they want to run. So we're calling this this load group S for the shield. And it's as you see, we just left it as normal, and so it's applying a concentric load of 50 kilonometers. And this this will be activated in the same stages as the shield as it's advancing. And so again, I, uh, these loads can be a little repetitive when you're applying them. So uh, we we kind of fast forward ahead until we get to the end of the application of this load, the S at the very end, which is like S10. And now I will apply the last load, which again is also a concentric pressure load on the rings. But this time it's going to be the load that it's going to be activated once the concrete segments are installed and it will be a, a higher load. So now we're going to say it's 100, sorry, 1,000 kilons per meter squared. And we're going to call this load, just going to give it the letter E as the set. Let's just say for segments or something like that. So again, this is a repetitive process. Every two is what we're simulating the advance of the excavation to be. So I just kind of fast forward ahead to get to the end of it. This is E9, and then we'll do E10. So that's our last set of loads. And we can now go into, we see here in the work street, all the sets of loads we applied. And we can now go into applying our boundary conditions. I'm going to deactivate now my geometries. So in some instances, uh, as we said, loads are very easily applied by activating geometries. But in other cases like boundary conditions, you can just directly, we have an auto feature that will, the program recognizes the the boundaries and automatically fixes the degrees of freedom that correspond to the direction of the faces accordingly. So we saw there the outer boundary was automatically applied. And now, as we were mentioning, we're going to use this command called change property. So this is a boundary condition. And I can select sets, for example, my external circles originally had the soil property. 
well, I now want it to have a, when I'm reactivating it, to have a different material, in this case, segment, which is reinforced concrete. And by using this constructor stage uh, sequence, the program will find, will activate these in the, or give them the same order or number corresponding to the original mesh set. And so we do the same for the shield. Originally, it was steel. And we're now defining a boundary condition that, if activated, will now represent the material of the grouting. And so now we can go on to define the stages themselves. First, I just have to create the, the set. So I'm just saying this is going to be stress analysis for in stages. We can do semi-coupled, fully coupled. We talked about this. And now we go into the wizard. So remember that this is all based on setting up rules for activating and removing sets or boundary conditions or loads and specifying which stage it starts and how many stages to uh, skip forward or to, to move ahead in. So we're saying, for instance, the inner circle is going to be removed or excavated starting in stage one. And I want you to skip uh, you know, two stages every time you do it. But since we're also uh, advancing in our model two at a time, I'm also going to just set up the same rule and tell it to additionally also start in stage two. So I wanted to advance two, two sets at a time. This is why I have to define the, the rule a second time and telling it it's going to advance in the same order. But I'm saying now start starting in stage one and starting in stage two, I want you to start removing. And for both, I want you to skip two ahead. So one and two, three and four, and so, so on and so forth. And then I can continue with the same for the outer circle and such. Here's a summary of, of what these rules are. I mean, you basically just follow the, down the line with the A, activate, R, R, remove, and the numbers representing the advance. And you can generate this whole table of commands. And then in the end, we just drag and drop into what well, we have this first column, which is the initial stage. So of course, before anything is excavated, it has to be already in place. So this is why we're activating all the inner circles. We're activating the original ground, the original boundary condition. So anything that's not going to be part of the you know, process that's excavated or, or re repeated uh, is just drag and drop in the initial stage, including the self-weight. And so once uh, this table is set up, we can kind of briefly see here how many stages we're going to have. We have 17 stages, and we see what's being removed and what's being activated, and including the loads. And once we click OK, the program will then generate the actual stages for us following these rules. So here I'm opening the initial stage, and I'm also clearing the displacements. We always do that in the first stage. And see, we see here now, uh, as I'm previewing going forward, we're seeing now that in stage four, for instance, external circles are reactivated, but now they're also activated in the same order as this boundary condition called external circles. So now even though it's the same mesh set, it now has a completely different behavior to be captured. And similarly with the shield, the shield is, uh, you know, we see that's going through at stage 15 and 16, but it's now being react. The initial part of the shield, uh, shield one and two, are also now being reactivated in accordance with the boundary condition. And here we get to the the very last stage, which is when the grouting is last installed. So the last thing is uh, just to set up the analysis case and set it up as a construction stage analysis. And we tell it that we want to consider the k naught condition and start the stress. And I can just run it. We're all set. So keep an eye out on the bottom of the model, the output window. That's going to tell us what stage we're in as we're advancing, if there's any warnings. And once it reaches the conclusion, uh, how long it took. So we see the label S10 representing the stage 10 level S11. So we see it's going fast. 
and then it gets to the end and it tells us there were no warnings. This is how long it took to run this analysis. And we're now in the post processor. So you see here in the works tree, now I'm in the last tab, the results tab. I'm going to activate all my mesh sets. The results are given in the order of the stages. My very first stage, of course, has zero displacements because I clear them. If I click on this bar and start going to the right on my keyboard, I can now move through the construction process. I can then switch my units at any point. Uh, we have this different ways to identify results. I have this option called probe and identify either points of interest or tell it to show me the max and the min uh, in every stage. So here I'm going to the last stage and I'm specifically checking settlements or displacements in the vertical direction. Uh, I can also buy type of element. For instance, I'm expanding here the shell elements. I'm looking at the principal stresses on my grouting support element. And these are the, the minor, the major and the minor. We have different ways of viewing the results. Uh, you know, if you want to have exaggerated deformation, you can also view it that way as well. Here I'm going to uh, take a look at the stresses on the solid segments of my support ring. So I go to principal A are my principal stresses, and principal C are my minor stresses, my major and my minor. So these are, because it's already the stages after the material has been changed, this is for the actual rings of the, the segment rings, the concrete rings. If we want to see or graph results, we have a command called extract. So for instance, I'm specifying the total displacements for all the stages, and I just changed that into a table format. I changed my units to millimeters, and I'm going to specify that my graph is not uh, using exponential format, but just regular fixed values. So I can either send this graph to Excel or directly you know, create it here in the, in the model, and we're seeing the displacement ranges increasing during the excavation process. So getting back to the presentation, one last thing I'd like to show in the post-processor. Uh, these are all the steps that we just covered. So just briefly to clarify, the drilling pressure load representing the face of the tunnel boring machine on the tunnel. And as we said, the jacks pushing back is the jack thrust load that we applied on the rings in the opposite direction on the face of the rings once the rings are installed. And then, of course, the shield pressure loads on the shield, and then the segment pressure loads. And so, again, in the PDF that you you can you will receive or you can download from our page, you will also have again the summary of what these stages were happening, so that it's more clear to you. I know in the video we we kind of skipped ahead uh, in this table format for setting up this table, but this is basically what the rules that they represent. And so we went through the results. And just the last thing I wanted to also show is that we have these very advanced features in our post-processor. One can do all kinds of cuts, as we call them, slices, on a 3D model, and then identify, even on a 3D cut, points of interest using our 3D to 2D. We call it wizard. Basically, you can activate all the nodes on that plane that you cut and select them for values. And then also, as we saw earlier, you can generate any kind of multi-step animation video that you can then use in your presentation. And we'll be sending out soon more details. Uh, we have an upcoming Diamond Engineer series in, in March. This will be a special training series that we'll be hosting. Uh, just keep an eye out for your emails from us. And so that is the conclusion of this training. I, I, I thank you so much.